This video is made possible by our sponsors, Google, Fonage, and 8x8. See the video description for links and more information. All right. Now, uh, up for our, our next session, uh, we'll be talking about end-to-end -end encryption. Uh, joining us today is a uh, repeat Cranky Geek speaker, uh, Emil Laval. Uh Emil is head of product for video collaboration at 8x8. Many of you may know him um, as the founder and, and project lead at the Jitsi the Open Source Project. Um, uh, Emil, maybe we can start, you can just tell the audience a little bit about um, what, what is NN encryption. Uh, let's do that. Thank you, Chad. And by the way, thank you for uh, hosting this great event once again this year. I'm really happy to be here. So as you said, let's, uh, let's have a look at what end-to-end -end encryption actually is. And um, specifically, I'd like to do that with in relation to transport encryption. So everyone clearly understands that in general, encryption and transport encryption is meant to protect your data from prying eyes for, for, from third parties. Um, what I want us to focus on here is that the, the one additional step that end-to-end -end encryption takes is to also protect your data from your service provider. So it's just the delta of one that is very important protecting your data from your service provider. Now, um, when is this important um, is a matter of, there's a number of different categories of use cases that vary in gravity and uh, intensity, I would say. You, you Typically, those would be things like um, the really grave cases would be, for example, industrial espionage. If the future of your company depends on protecting um, some core piece of differentiating innovation, then uh, then you'd like to probably go as far as protecting it from your uh, service provider as well. Uh, same same thing goes for government overreach. Uh, governments that uh, would abuse their power to pursue dissidents, for example, um, or, or, or a number of other scenarios there are also a good reason why people have been traditionally interested in end-to-end -end encryption. And then finally, there's also the cloak and dagger stuff, um, where uh, you, you could imagine that a conversation between uh, Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel uh, would be of, of, of significant interest to competing geopolitical powers or conversations within a specific administration, uh, the same thing goes for them. So that's another case where end-to-end -end encryption is usually a very, a, a very hard requirement. Now, then we have a different category that has to do with, um, that's, I, I would say, this general feeling of discomfort that we have developed as a society with the level of access that the providers of our services have to our data. We're uncomfortable with them constructing advertising profiles around us. And I would say that I'm putting this in different category, not only in terms of gravity, and, but it also intensity, because you could see that by the number of users that serv such services have, whether it's Instagram or Facebook or Google or whatever, you could see that this is clearly not a showstopper for, for most users. But still, you know, it's a reason why people often go and say, I, I wish I had end -end encryption so that they wouldn't have access to that. Um, and then finally, there's the, the perspective of, um, you know, the, the providers. Uh, providers themselves are often interested in end -end encryption as well. Why is that? Well, um, a, a very strong, actually, reason uh, that, that doesn't get talked about enough, but that is very one of the strongest reasons why people deploy end-to-end -end encryption is because it spares them the liability. It reduces the surface of exposure uh, in terms of their responsibility to protect user data. So the less you have access to data, the, um, the, the less it, it can get compromised and the less you have to spend efforts protecting it. Um, and then you have compliance. Now, that's kind of different from all the other th things that we saw because uh, um, compliance usually gets created for specific use cases, but then it doesn't really matter to the provider what the use cases are. They just need to check a box and say, okay, I'm, I'm complying with this regulation and um, I'm, I'm happy to uh, you know, implement end-to-end -end encryption because it will help me sell more. Now, since recently, very recently, there's been, I would say, um, a, a fourth category of, of, of the type of interest that, uh, that people have in end-to-end -end encryption, both providers and users, it kind of became cool to support end-to-end -end encryption. <laughs> can, can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, as far as I can tell, this really started earlier this year when there were revelations around the fact that um, Zoom um, had advertised support for end-to-end -end encryption, and it turns out to use... Um, the words of the FTC that, in fact, it provided a lower level of security. 
Now, I would say that um, while interest in end-to-end encryption at that point exploded, it wasn't because all of a sudden a bunch of people found themselves in use cases that heavily required end-to-end encryption. I think the reason was that, uh, you know, this goes to a very core uh, property of, of, of human psychology, which is that nothing disrupts us as much as to, to have unmet expectations about the world. We thought the world would this way when we're doing our meetings with end-to-end encryption, and then we learned that it actually wasn't. So what is this now? I, um, what, where are we? What is this world? Are every, is everyone able to read my, my, my meeting notes and, and, and whatnot? So, um, so that created this substantial level of urgency around end-to-end encryption. Uh, and um, obviously, Zoom started um, working heavily on that, yeah. but not only then, actually. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, uh, this is a, you know, a mostly WebRC developers, I guess I mean, we, we cover everyone, but you know, what, can you talk a little bit about what does end end encryption mean specifically for WebRTC, right? And I know this is not a new approach, but maybe you can go through some of that. That, that, that is a, um, a, a great topic because it has been discussed pretty much from the start of WebRTC, but it has been a, 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 a tricky thing to deal with. So um, just as a reminder, from the beginning, WebRTC was uh, constructed, was architected with this very sound security model that builds upon uh, DTLS SRDP, which is used to protect the transport. Now, um, that didn't extend to uh, the use cases of meetings and the way that meetings are generally offered, which is through some sort of a middle box, usually a selected forwarding unit. And the properties of DTLS SRDP are such that... Um, Selective forwarding units, these middle boxes, they need to decrypt data from one participant and re-encrypt it so that it matches the context of another participant, which makes them, which gives them the option to see all user data that's being exchanged. And um, the first substantial effort to address this on a, in, a, in a public way was the ITF PERC working group. Um, now, for a variety of reasons, that working group didn't reach enough consensus to actually roll out a deliverable, but I think it helped a lot in that it sort of helped um, that for everyone to agree that the best way to address end-to-end encryption in WebRTC was not to modify how DTLS SRDP acts with SFUs, but everyone just went, you know what, let's just leave DTLS SRDP alone. Um, let's have it do its own encryption. And that's how we were going to authenticate RTCP messages and NACs and FIRs and all of that stuff. And then what we're going to do is going to add an inner layer of encryption. That'll be, um, that'll be the end to end part. And that'll be transparent to SFUs. And I think that idea was, um, was pretty, uh, pretty valuable. So, okay. <laughs> but that's not, that's not where we ended up, right? So oh. that is, that is not where we ended up. It, it's, uh, the next step was for, uh, Google did this really neat thing earlier this year, um, which is the insertable streams API. Now, the idea of insertable streams is that you would take the usual WebRTC pipeline, which very simplistically is I get images, I encode them, and then I send them. And then the same thing in the opposite direction for receive. Um, so you would get that pipeline and you would be able to insert yourself. And by you, I mean the JavaScript application would be able to insert itself in the middle. So the, the app gets access to the encoded image and it can do transformations with it. And primarily those transformations would be um, would be encryption. So the way this looks in code, it's, um, it, it's really quite neat, quite simple. You simply have to create your peer connection, um, telling it that it needs to support insertable streams. And then you would get this, uh, these hooks. The insertable stream is actually a pair of hooks that where you can essentially um, uh, plug yourself in order to get access to all the data. This is what you do with these transformers. And then you attach them as a pipe, uh, your, your transformer, the actual code, you attach it as a pipe to, um, you know, to, to, to the flow of data. The same thing happens in the opposite direction. You create your peer connection, you get your insertable streams, and you plug the hook, the pipe of, of your encryption. And encryption itself is, um, is, is actually pretty JavaScript friendly because once you get the chunk from, from the WebRTC API, you, you don't have to do the actual encryption yourself. You can rely on Web Crypto APIs to give you AES encryption and GCM and, uh, and all that, uh, all that good stuff. So it's a pretty web friendly way to do WebRTC. I'm, I'm, um, I'm really happy that Google did that. Uh, we got on top of yeah, that. You, you feel make that work? Yeah, yes, uh, we, we got on top of that in, in April. Uh, Philip Hanke, uh, who everyone here knows, uh, was the first to take a stab at it within the, the GT community. Uh, and, and this was the, uh, the first result from it, uh, where 
um, you, you know, you, it works. You know, you you get data unless you have the end-to-end -end encryption context. You see, uh, you see scrambled stuff. So, um, so the um, the 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 next step of the insertable streams API is because currently you have you have to remember that this is a Chrome specific API. And um, it has, however, been recently just adopted um, as uh, so. Um, Emad's draft has been just adopted by an ITF working group called uh, S Frame that has been adopted as the working group document. It will be the basis of the first working group deliverable, and I'm and I'm really excited about it. Not because we get to to see a bunch of ASCII art diagrams, which everyone just enjoys uh, immensely, but also because you know if there's one rule about security, if there's one rule about encryption. It is, do not get created, do not roll your own. And yet today, as far as end-to-end -end encryption is concerned, that's what everyone does, simply because there is no, um, you know, WebRTC compatible standard for web for end-to-end -end encrypted meetings. And I'm really, really happy that uh, the S-Frame working group is going to tackle that problem. Um, so, does that make sense? Uh, I guess, it, 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 well, it looks like, uh, you know, Perk, Introduced some of the ideas. It was implemented in practice today in the servable streams. You know, S frame is kind of the the path of where it's going. So, is this like a does this solve a problem now? Yeah, right. So, first of all, that's exactly right. That's a good summary. With regard to problem being solved, I I, I would add two rather serious caveats. So, the first one is less serious. It is that hey, if you're going to need end to end encryption. Um, you have to keep in mind that it is inherently incompatible with a bunch of uh, functionality that is usually provided by the service provider. Um, you know, you want to be able to join a meeting over the phone, forget end-to-end -end encryption because the, the infrastructure needs to have access to the media streams in order to decode them, mix them, and send them, uh, transfer them to the PSTN. Same thing, want to be able to join with uh, telepresence endpoints, same things need to happen. You want transcription for your meetings, that's usually done in the cloud. Cloud recordings, even the cool stuff that we saw Serge presenting earlier this year, uh, the noise cancellation and packet loss concealment stuff in Google Meet, uh, that, as far as I understand, is also proposed, uh, offered by, um, uh, by the infrastructure. So all of that is out the minute you have true end-to-end -end encryption. There is a bigger issue that, 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 that I believe is um, quite, uh, quite a challenge here. And um, I, I don't really know how we're going to get out of it. Um, it would have to go back to the times when end-to-end -end encryption was invented as a model. Um, like think about email, for example. Uh, when you do PGP and end-to-end -end encryption uh, for your for email communication, there is this inherent assumption that the thing that does the end-to-end -end encryption, your email client, whether that's Thunderbird or whatever, um, it will be provided by a different entity, a different vendor than the thing that gives you your service. Um, so so that you can actually trust that, that you know, there's no conflict of interest there. Well, that's not how video conferencing works today. For a bunch of very good reasons, all of our meetings today uh, use client code that is actually provided by the service providers that are also providing us with a service. Um, and I want to be very clear that this is not a problem that is exclusive to WebRTC or that is specific to any video conferencing provider out there. But it does put us in this situation that we can summarize as, so, you know, we go and tell our provider, are you doing anything funny with your data? And they tell us, no, we're not. And then we go, well, we don't trust you. So we need you to pinky swear that you're not doing it. And um, that's kind of, that sort of a pinky swear is, is sort of what you get with, with, with the end-to-end -end, with end -end encryption coupled with the cloud distribution model of apps. And, and I'm not saying that there's no value in a pinky swear, and I'm only half joking here. Um, but one has to be very, very cognizant of the limitations of, 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 that, of that trust model. Yeah, so I guess, are you saying uh, this is all kind of partly a, a futile effort? And, uh, um, I, 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 I'm, thank you for asking me that question because that's absolutely not what I want to say. Um, it is, however, a very nuanced and complex, uh, complex problem. And there's, I think, um, two things people that need end-to-end -end encryption uh, can do here. One of them, we can hope that browsers are eventually going to solve this, and they're going to be the endpoint that can do the verifications. I wouldn't hold my breath, because I think it'd be very complicated for a browser 
to actually understand what it means to do something funny with your data from the outside. I don't think that's actually possible. Um, the other thing uh, that I would advise people with uh, you know, serious security concerns is if your life depends on it, if your country's future depends on it, run it yourself. Now, that's not so hard to do. I would say that's the good news here, that, for example, we in the JITI community spend tremendous amounts of effort to make sure that you can um, run your own instances of Jitsi very, very easily. Hopefully that would help. Um, and um, yeah, let's see, uh, let's see how we go from here. Thank you to our sponsors. We would like to thank Google for supporting the WeberTC community in this event series. Learn more about WeberTC at webertc.org. Vonage, creating engaging experiences that move with your customers. See more at bonnage.com slash communications dash APIs. 8x8, embed full featured WebRC meetings in your app with the Jitsi as a service beta. Sign up at 8x8.com slash crankygeek.